a very warm, warm welcome to everyone to our conference, long awaited, planned for a couple of years already, on Joseph Ratzinger from a variety of perspectives from Finland and from the other side of the planet, from Australia. And I would like to, in this lecture, present a little bit of the background of this conference and also something about Ratzinger in Finland and something about the Finnish Christian context. It is perhaps mainly planned for our uh, international guests, but also will hopefully serve uh, everyone here in some way. My name is Emil, Emil Anton, and I have been organizing this lecture together with Cultural Center Sofia, where we are happy to be here in beautiful uh, Helsinki, Eastern Helsinki, surrounded by the Baltic Sea and our green forests. And also with the Studium Catholicum, our Dominican brothers, who are kind to celebrate Mass for us at the beginning of this conference today, and will do so again tomorrow morning. I will come back to the program of the conference at the end of the lecture uh, to review it again with you, uh, but now we will dive straight into uh, the topic. So, first of all, the background of this lecture uh, is that uh, I did my PhD here in Helsinki on Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, and his Theology of Religions and Interreligious Dialogue. Um, inspired by Professor Mika Ruokanen, who cannot be here today, but his brother is here. Uh, so, uh, also a very famous pastor and journalist, Tapani, so we are honored to have you. And, um, and, and Mika is a well-known theologian in Finland and also has studied the theology of religion, so he inspired me to, to this topic. And then somehow, um, Professor Tracy Rowland got to know about me and asked me to participate in this project, international project called the Ratzinger Dictionary, which is under preparation now and will be published next year. Uh, and it will be published in several languages. The first edition will be in English. And it is a collection of articles by 72 people uh, on various aspects of Ratzinger's thought. And my idea, my vision was to uh, to invite people that participated in this project to come here. Uh, now only two came from abroad, but the 70, the 70 were uh, left behind. But, uh, but uh, well, quality, not quantity. Anyway, we are here despite COVID and the war and everything. So, but this is the uh, first two steps of the background. The third one was that I was, uh, I had been thinking about the Ratzing conference before already. And, uh, and, and I realized that this year Ratzinger turns, or turned 95. It's a big year, and uh, we were thinking about having this conference in April on Holy Week for his 95th birthday. Uh, but uh, then we decided that maybe it's better to have it uh, at the beginning of June, and it was fine with me because it's my birthday. So <laughs> anyway, for Ratzinger's birthday, we went to Ratzinger's hometown with some friends, some of them are here, and, uh, and uh, a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, so we spent Ratzinger's birthday in Germany, and now for my birthday Ratzinger conference. So this is also my birthday present to myself. Um, and then we have also the fifth element, which is the reindeer. So you might have noticed that the title Ratzinger and reindeer. And this came from our correspondence with Professor Tracy Rowland. So someone from Australia has not seen reindeer and loves reindeer. And I thought, you know, Ratzinger and Reindeer unite us, so let's do a Ratzinger conference in Finland with a visit to see some reindeer. We have them also here in southern Finland, in Espo, in the National Park, Nuuksio, so that's our program tomorrow then. Uh, so those are the five points behind this conference, that's how, how it arose, and here we are. So welcome again, and happy to finally uh, live this day that has been uh, awaited so long. Now, indeed we went to Germany with uh, five friends for Ratzinger's 95th birthday. Pope Benedict was born on Holy Saturday in Markt, a small town in Bavaria. And this year, 
Holy Saturday was also his birthday. So every year Holy Saturday is a different date, but this year it was again his birthday. And so it was perfect to go to his birth house where there was uh, a special prayer on his birth minute, nine, uh, sorry, 4.15 a.m. 4.15, very early. And uh, there were about 20 people there and most of them were locals, a little bit elderly, and then there were five young Finnish men. <laughs> and three of them are here. Yes, so Tommy was there and Joanna was there. And um, four out of five were uh, Catholic converts and four out of five were theologians. So it, it was quite interesting. And um, we had a wonderful time. We went to all those places, uh, Freising, where uh, Ratzinger received his priestly ordination, where he studied at the seminary, and where he was, of course, later also the Archbishop of Munich and Freising, the historical center of Bavarian uh, Christianity and Catholicism. Then we went to the Abbey of Scheyern, where he used to go for a retreat every year, Benedictine Abbey. Then we went to Regensburg, where he was, of course, a famous professor at the University of Regensburg, and, um, and then later gave the famous Regensburg address or the lecture in 2006, uh, which is the most famous instance of his sort of engagement with uh, Islam and, and the religions, religious dialogue. Then also Pentling, which is just outside the Regensburg, where is uh, Ratzinger's house. So he bought a house, he wanted to retire there, and uh, it never happened. So, but, but the house is still there where he used to live in those professorial years. And then we went to Altötting, the Marian sanctuary that is closest to Ratzinger's heart and also very close to his hometown, marked where we visited this birth house that you see on, on the photo. And then all of his childhood villages, so he moved a lot because his father was a policeman and they had to move many times. And also during the Nazi era, they had to move a little bit to kind of be in safer places. The father was very much anti-Nazi and, and didn't want to get into trouble and and, uh, and they wanted uh, their own house and so on. And so then uh, he lived in these different towns, Tittmoning, Aschau and Hofschlag and we, we visited all of those houses uh, or at least you know saw them on the outside. And then Traunstein where he went to seminary uh, which is uh, right next to Hofschlag, or Hofschlag is next to Traunstein. And then finally Munich for the Easter Vigil, led by uh, Pope Ratzinger's successor, uh, the, the Cardinal, and uh, it was a beautiful Easter Vigil. And then we went to have uh, Ratzinger's favorite uh, beer in his favorite uh, place, Augustiner Klosterwirt, and also the Apfelstrudel, his favorite dessert. So it was a very graced and wonderful Ratzinger pilgrimage and also we were covered in Regensburg uh, Diocese website. Uh, we saw the bishop after the Holy Thursday Mass and uh, he was excited that some Finns came for a Ratzinger pilgrimage and they took a photo and did a short interview with us. Okay, then what about Ratzinger in Finland? This is a little known topic. It might be interesting to know that actually there was a PhD on Ratzinger long before me, I'm not the first one. Uh, the first one was already in 93 by Sakari Toivianin, I have it here. It is called uh, From Subject to Object in Finnish though. The Change of Emphasis in Ratzinger's Transcendental Thought Form. And uh, this is uh, maybe the, the, in my opinion, probably the best case for um, the view, and you know, you know that in Ratzinger studies it's a big question whether he changed his mind a lot, like in 68, you know, there were the student revolutions and so on, and if he became a sort of more conservative from a more liberal or more uh, progressive perspective, he turned back to, to a more conservative perspective. And then it is sort of customary to say that, that no, that he was, uh, you know, consistent from beginning to end. But then there are also some cases where he says that, well, in those cases, those situations, you could not remain a liberal anymore and that people do change and develop a bit. So there's kind of some, some of his sayings go both ways or either way. And uh, whatever you think about it, but probably the best case for the view that he did quite radically change his mind or his sort of basic thought form is this uh, dissertation. It's in Finnish, but there is a good summary in German. So I'm just thinking if the international scholars want to read the summary just to know, you know, so I have it here. 
so this was actually it's sort of the typical Finnish uh, systematic theology uh, thesis, so kind of a uh, heavy language and it also relates Ratzinger very strongly to Reiner's sort of transcendental uh, system and uh, at least you know in the beginning and uh, uh, yeah so sort of like old school Finnish systematic theological dissertation this uh, pastor the author is, is, is now still a Lutheran pastor working with other things so he's not anymore so much involved in Ratzinger studies but he's still an active Lutheran pastor um, and uh, once he met Ratzinger when he was he has told me this anecdote he visited Ratzinger in Rome and then Ratzinger asked him, like, how are you doing with that big Lutheran church over there? And then he said, well, I'm a Lutheran pastor. So Ratzinger thought he was Catholic. But uh, anyway, so this is the first, <laughs> this is the first um, uh, dissertation. And then after that, my dissertation is the second, but there are many more master's theses about Ratzinger. So the, uh, first of all, Samuel Koivuran does uh, religions in dialogue. It also kind of... Uh, refers to this this work and other studies and is also a good solid work in the old sort of the Finnish systematic theological uh, method and uh, and Samuel is here also with us so he, he, he got I think the highest grade for his master's thesis and it is sim a similar topic to mine but mine was not so much a, a big synthesis but more like articles you know about this and that uh, particular topic um, then as you see more recently it seems that there are more and more people interested in Ratzinger and there have been fairly many master's theses published on uh, Ratzinger's thought in Finland. I just checked both in the University of Eastern Finland, that's the UEF, and in Helsinki. Uh, people have studied love in Deus Caritas Est, Eucharistic Ecclesiology, uh, Justice in Caritas in Veritate, uh, Revelation in Jesus of Nazareth, the Trilogy, and then also the people have done analysis of how Pope Benedict has been covered in the media, both in the Finnish media and in the international media, so, uh, and also Catholic and secular. So Juha Ahosniemi studied how Pope Benedict was covered in the biggest Finnish newspapers, Helsingin Sanomat and Ilta Sanomat, during his papacy. And one just interesting detail is that Helsingin Sanomat, the biggest newspaper in Finland, took the side of Pope Benedict after the Regensburg address. So the, the editor actually read the address and then he wrote like an editorial that Ratzik, the Pope was right, you know, that he had a good point. Um, and then the, the other was about how Pope Benedict was covered in Fides magazine, which is our diocesan newspaper here in the Catholic Church in, in Finland. And then this Juha Ahosniemi, he is now studying, he's the, beginning his doctoral studies and he will be studying, uh, I think, how Pope Benedict was covered in the English media, I believe, uh, during his papers. Then finally there was also a bachelor's thesis on uh, Ratzinger's uh, thought on hope in space alvi. So in summary you can see that people are um, interested in, well, the, the encyclicals, they have also been translated, and, and the Jesus trilogy. And of course, Eucharistic Ecclesiology is a very sort of typical topic on, on Ratzinger. And then there is this thing with the interreligious dialogue as well. So that's more or less what I, I don't claim this is 100% complete. There might be some other works also that I wasn't, wasn't able to find, but at least this many. Well then, what about Ratzinger's uh, theology in Finland, like Ratzinger's reception in Finland? This is the most famous uh, instance that has been talked about a lot in Finland. And uh, is probably not known outside of Finland, but but very interesting uh, that uh, the so-called fifth revival. I will tell about the four other revivals <laughs> later, but the fifth Lutheran revival in Finland, which is something like uh, influenced by evangelicalism, Anglo-American evangelicalism. Uh, so this Urho Muroma, whose picture you see there, he was a preacher uh, starting like from the early 1900s. Uh, going to different places and preaching and, and making people sort of commit their lives to Christ and and uh, and, and and a lot of people got sort of well a awakened and and a movement was formed then in the 50s and 60s that became known as the fifth uh, movement or fifth awakening in Finland and uh, and this movement was known 
uh, as a very anti-Catholic movement. So this uh, Pastor Murama, inside the Lutheran Church, he was controversial for rejecting baptismal regeneration. So, so he did not believe that uh, people become sort of children of God in, in baptism and saved in baptism, but you also have to sort of commit your life uh, and, uh, to, out of your own will uh, to, to Christ and believe in him. So, so this was something that uh, sort of made him controversial, and, and he thought that this baptismal regeneration is a sort of uh, satanic or magical or devilish Catholic uh, heresy. And so, so this, the, this uh, movement has been very anti-Catholic also, even in the 90s when there was the joint declaration on justification, and this movement was sort of the leading force in criticizing this uh, joint declaration and saying that that no, no, we do not agree, and, and uh, this is sort of giving in to this uh, horror of Babel kind of ecumenism. Yeah. So this was a very anti-Catholic moment until the 90s and maybe even early 2000s. But then Pope Benedict published his books on, on Jesus, and the first book was translated into Finnish, not by any religious publisher, but by an academic publisher. And then the theologians started reading the, the Jesus of Nazareth book, and everyone was like, whoa, this is good stuff. You know, the Pope writes about Jesus in a beautiful way, and and, and hey, you know, and, and we have to think about this, and, and it's almost like, you know, many people said, like, a Lutheran can accept everything except maybe one page or something, if there's something about Peter the Pope or something, but, you know, just disregard one page, but the rest is, like, perfect. And then, when he published the second part, this publisher didn't want to publish it anymore. And then the uh, Lutheran publisher from this fifth movement, they picked it up, and they thought, we will publish it. And of course, they got a lot of criticism from their, their old people. You know, they said, "How can we publish the Pope?" and so on. And, you know, he's the Antichrist and whatever. But, but then, but then the, the director of this movement, uh, he said, "You know, the Pope writes about Jesus better than many a Lutheran theologian or bishop. So just read the book and then complain." You know, so first read the book. And uh, they published the second part, and they also published the third part of the trilogy. Into, in, in Finnish, and and uh, it has become quite well known in the Finnish circles and quite well respected. This uh, Jesus trilogy. Okay, what about the other books that have been translated to Finnish? Uh, and also, well, I might add that now the Fifth Movement is sort of uh, quite friendly. They have published other books by Catholics, and let's say they um, they share so much in terms of many values and and so on in the current situation that uh, even me as a Catholic, I feel many times that the Fifthers are sort of some of the spiritually closest people, yeah, that are sort of easy to, to share a lot of, uh, you know, uh, ideas with, yeah, and the same spirit as well. So here is the, here it is, a uh, beautiful picture of all the Ratzinger books that have been translated into Finnish. It might be a surprise, but yeah, the Catholic Information Center, so the Catholic Church in Finland is very small, and the information center is even smaller. It's maybe two people, <laughs> so, but they are quite effective. So, uh, well, maybe it's four people, but anyway, they have published a lot of Ratzinger books in Finnish. And you can see that there are some encyclicals. Those are the sort of white and yellow publications, the official text of the Pope. But then there are also some important theological works like eschatology, uh, the introduction to Christianity, Spirit of the Liturgy, and uh, On the Way to Jesus Christ, God is Near Us. And then there are some of these interview books, like uh, The Last Conversations and The Light of the World. And then there's a couple books that I also influenced uh, in the sense that uh, I really like this small book called On uh, What It Means to Be a Christian. It's uh, Advent Sermons to Students. And what I really love about Ratzinger in that book and in many other books is that he usually starts with recognizing the problem, like understanding why it's difficult in our time to believe, and then he starts from there. And then um, the other one is uh, this collection of lectures or speeches, rather, um, and it includes the Regensburg address, the Regensburg speech, and also uh, three other speeches. One of them was at Luther's monastery in Erfurt, and another one was to Muslims in Cologne, and another one was in the Be Berlin uh, Bundestag uh, to politicians. So these are all speeches in Germany, which is sort of culturally, historically linked to Finland in many ways. 
and they are to different audiences like academics, politicians, Lutherans, Muslims. So this is a, a collection of four speeches, the one on the top right. Okay, then there is this uh, interesting publication, the uh, Verbum Domini, which is co-published by the Catholic in Information Center, our Diocese and Information Center, and the Finnish Bible Society, which is, as they say, the oldest Christian uh, organization active in Finland. They are 200 years old, and then the Dominicans say, <laughs> <laughs> we are 800 years old, yes. But okay, the Dominicans' presence has not been uninterrupted, and now they just let's say now you have been here since uh, 49, 1949. So in that sense, they have been here longer continuously. But okay, we can debate that. But anyway, it's a nice ecumenical publication by the Finnish Bible Society and. Uh, uh, and, uh, and the Catholic Information Center. Right, and the Finnish Bible Society is just a society that basically makes and sells and distributes Bibles. It's different from the Finnish Bible Institute, which is the fifth turners uh, in theological, let's say, and well, institute where they teach a lot of things. Okay, then who has been translating these books? There are two people to thank. So one is Katri Tenhunen, who works at the Catholic Information Center. She has studied um, Biblical studies in Helsinki, like exegesis, and also in Rome, uh, especially Old Testament. And uh, then there is uh, Jarmo Kirunen, who is also an exegete, biblical scholar, especially of the New Testament and Greek. But as all the uh, older generation Finnish theologians, they, they know German very well, so, so then uh, he, he has uh, translated these Ratzinger books for three publishers, so the first academic one, the Jesus Trilogy, for both the academic and the Lutheran publisher, and also for the Catholic publisher. So thanks go, go to them. Well then, uh, another interesting new thing that happened, thanks to the Dominicans recently, is the publication of this new history of the popes by this young Finnish historian called Jaro Karkinen, young talent who since high school was very interested in the popes and he's Lutheran but he learned all the popes by heart like from Peter to, to the present and, and he has been interested in the history of the popes and now finally decided to write one himself and I think I haven't read that many histories of the popes but I have read some and I think his multi-volume history one volume has been published now until Gregory the Great and it's something like 500 pages um, it will be maybe five volumes in the end. I think it will be like world class. It would be one of the best histories of the Pope, like anywhere. It is an incredibly uh, balanced. It is incredibly uh, well researched, well written, illustrated. Uh, it's just so good. And, and even as a theologian, he's a historian. But it's like I learned so much. And even the professors of uh, church history and ecumenics say that they learned so much from from him. So he's like a, uh, a wonder. Uh, uh, what's it? Uh, Wunderkind. Yeah. Yes, and uh, and and what, why I mention it here is that he makes heavy use of Ratzinger. He really likes La Ratzinger, and even when he's writing about Peter and the early papacy and so on, he somehow you know incorporates insights from a lot of Ratzinger's writings. So that's uh, also some nice <laughs> channel of popularizing Ratzinger's thought in, in Finland. This this new project, and it has sold quite well. I understood to many libraries and and also individuals. Uh, well then, we could move to the more sort of official level and to famous theologians and ecumenists, so maybe the most famous and most important Finnish theologian and ecumenist in this context is Bishop Eero Huovinen um, of Helsinki uh, in 91 to 2010, now retired, but he is the chair of the Lutheran Catholic Dialogue Commission, so the international one, on the Lutheran side. And that is the commission that published, for example, the document from conflict to communion and uh, for the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. So he has said, for example, he did first, uh, first his uh, PhD on Hans Küng, but then he found that Hans Küng was too much concerned about himself and what the other people think about him, and he also invited him to Finland, he was here. Uh, and then he read Ratzinger and he found that Ratzinger is more profound and acute than than Hans Kuhn. And uh, Bishop Hovinen has also written a lot of books in Finnish and also some in English. 
and he has popularized and commented on Ratzinger's book on Jesus, and um, uh, and and he has also said on several occasions that Finnish Christians, Finnish Lutherans, have a sort of uh, yeah, Catholic identity. They want to belong to the Catholic Church of Christ, and this is a fairly common identity among Finnish Lutherans. That it is not a Protestant identity, but it is more of a Catholic identity. That as one of these uh, Lutheran pastors who did a masters on on Ratzinger told me recently that uh, um, if I thought that my church was founded 500 years ago, you know, it would be pointless. Like I would not belong to it. Like like uh, so. So they they don't consider their church to have been founded in the 1500s, but they see it as a continuation of the medieval church here in Finland and and as a, a basically reform movement in the Catholic Church that, of course, unfortunately, uh, you know, it, what happened happened and, you know, there's no communion and so on, but, but that's not their choice and not their identity. Okay. Well, who's behind all of this is uh, Huovinen's teacher, Seppo Teinanen, who's no longer uh, with us on this planet. But uh, he was really the father of, we can say, Finnish high Lutheranism or, uh, or Catholic Lutheranism or Lutheran Catholicism, Lutheran Catholic Ecumenism. He was an observer at the Second Vatican Council. He's not really known outside of Finland because he didn't write much in English or I don't know if he wrote anything in English, but he wrote a lot in Finnish and, and, um, and really changed the face of Finnish Lutheranism. Uh, he was professor in Helsinki from the 60s to 80s in Ecumenism. And he translated a lot of Catholic mystics into Finnish, St. Francis Thomas Aquinas, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, Ignatius Loyola, Jose Maria Escriva, and so on. And in 73, he famously said that all the Finnish Christians should uh, join uh, together by uh, 85. And he said that the Lutheran Church does not have the right to exist uh, apart from, or on its own, and, and that it should uh, join, rejoin Mother Church. Well, that did not happen, but he did it himself when he retired became Catholic and moved to Spain, where he died. And um, yeah, so before Teinonen, of course, Finnish Lutheranism was influenced a lot by uh, pietism and different this pietistic movements, revival movements, and of course also by enlightenment, uh, rationalism. But uh, this, this is a very important development. And after Teinonen, there is uh, his pupil or student Mannerma, and uh, that is a very famous uh, school of uh, Lutheran interpretation, Tuomo Mannerma's students, he himself first and then his students who are still active. Uh, Mannerma himself also was like Huovinen, first studying Catholic theologians, he was studying Rainer and he wrote uh, a couple of good important pieces on Rainer's theology. But uh, then he moved later to uh, Luther, Luther uh, studies and and became a very famous Luther scholar. And it started actually with the Finnish, Lutheran, and Russian Orthodox uh, dialogues. So there were uh, ecumenical dialogues between Finnish Lutherans and Russian Orthodox. They were trying to find some common ground. And uh, Mannerma and his friends, they assumed that there must be some common ground because there's the common Christological creed from the you know, early church. And then uh, with, Rain uh, with the Mannerma, they discovered that there is, for example, uh, theosis or deification in Luther, which was usually regarded as an orthodox uh, way of presenting salvation, and Lutherans would present it as justification, and then he started explaining that Luther is actually much more medieval than uh, especially the German scholars thought who would read him through Kant, Kantian eyes. And uh, there have been uh, several books written about this, both by Finns and by international scholars. Uh, there is a book uh, by uh, Lutheran scholars Braten and Jensen, Jensen let's say, uh, about the conference held in 93 in the United States, that the Finnish delegation was by far the most impressive and interesting new voice in the seminars with Manerma and his uh, students. And they, with their new view of, of justification, as, as Manerma says, real ontic righteousness, real and ontic basically mean the same thing, one is Latin and the other is Greek, but it sounds fancy when you say it in two languages, yes? And, and uh, well, you could say ontological, but you, it's nicer to come up with a new term and say ontic. Anyway, so, uh, so then uh, Christ is present in faith is the main 
idea, so in ipsa fide Christus adest, in Latin, for Luther, you know, grace and mercy is not only outside of us, but in faith Christ is present there inside. So this brings in the sort of transformative and real aspect. And, uh, and then uh, this was very influential to uh, find agreement on the joint declaration in the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification, which as you know, hopefully was saved by Ratzinger in the end in his home there in Pentling, I think. Uh, so it was in trouble because of certain differences, but then Ratzinger saved it, but also the Finns were very influential in preparing it or for it theologically. Okay, so this is one famous thing, but then uh, Mandarma students, as I said, they are still active today and just uh, recently there was a very good new PhD dissertation published on Luther's view of faith and the light of faith and interestingly it starts with a Pope Benedict quotation from Spe Salvi and there Pope Benedict explains uh, from Hebrews 11, you know, I think it's the beginning of 11, yeah, like what faith is and then uh, he says how Luther interpreted it and then he says but Luther was, well I don't know if he says it like this, Luther was wrong but that's the sort of idea that Luther was wrong and, and, and then Karimis says that well no, he's as a good Lutheran, the Pope was wrong and he got Luther wrong because he's reading Luther through the German existentialists, you know, uh, Kantian theologians eyes, so uh, Luther actually is much more medieval and actually Luther uh, is much stronger on what Bob Benedict wants to, to convey, which is the sort of rea real presence and reality and uh, e effectiveness of, uh, of faith and grace. So uh, Karimius writes that, that it is actually the other way around and Luther's theology, in Luther's theology the concept of faith is actually more immediate and bears more efficacy than the Catholic notion. And what he asks, what kind of ecumenical possibilities might this insight offer at least the traditional claim made by some Catholic theologians that grace and faith are not effective in the Lutheran view appears to have been demonstrated to be false. The core point of this issue was solved in the Joint Declaration on the just doctrine of justification. But of course the Declaration doesn't go into the details of Luther's thought and then Spesal became much later and Ratzinger still brings up this difference between Luther's view and the Thomas Aquinas view and so on. So it's very interesting and a good contribution from the Finnish school. And interesting also criticism of uh, Ratzinger, good to know that it exists. And, and uh, definitely recommend reading this um, profound dissertation in detail. It basically argues that uh, Luther was more, more of a Franciscan in his theology. Yeah. Then we have uh, some other noteworthy areas in Finnish theology that have some Ratzingerian relevance. So first of all, for Ratzinger, the Bible is always very important and central. So in Finland, of course, is a, is a, in a Lutheran country, the Bible has been very central and important. So there's a lot of exegetes, a lot of biblical studies. And so the famous one is Heike Räisänen and his main work, The Rise of Christian Beliefs, which is not only his work, but it does, it's also sort of a gallery where he brings in all of his students' studies and sort of it's, uh, all of the Finnish scholarship on display there. It's a very critical approach, sort of a history of religion kind of approach. And Raisanen is famous for basically losing his faith during his studies, and, and is, uh, but still remained in the church, Lutheran church, and uh, uh, remained a pastor. So a bit like a Hans Kuhn figure, uh, you know, uh, equivalent maybe. Uh, a different kind of temperament and personality for sure, but, but, but in some ways a parallel. Uh, so, so that's uh, the, the Raisen exege exegetical school is big. The exegetes in Turku or Opo Academy and University of Eastern Finland are a bit different. Uh, they are more from, uh, let's say, conservative Lutheran circles and and uh, also very good and fa world famous work class exegetes Antilato and Lauri Turen, but uh, different different kind of emphasis there. The other big area is Septuagint studies, where Finland is really a point of reference. Uh, Ilmari Soisalan Soinen started the so-called Helsinki School, and it's continued by Anneli Emeleus. And of course, well, Septuagint is important for Ratzinger as well, and Augustine, the Greek version of the, the Old Testament. Well, then Pauline studies, so there was a year of St. Paul, declared by Pope Benedict in 2008 and 2009. 
And uh, there is a lot of Finnish scholars who have studied Paul because Paul is the Lutheran apostle and the <laughs> Finns are Lutheran, so they write a lot about Paul. And there is a book called The Nordic Paul where there are some Finnish contributions. And uh, this is mentioned, the, the Finnish scholars are mentioned in Stephen Westerholm's book Perspectives Old and New on Paul, where he says, among the topics warmly debated in the saunas of Finland is the new perspective on Paul. Sauna debates. And we have them. Then there's medieval studies, Simo Knuttila. Augustine is on the rise. There's Timon Isula in Turku and Eetu Manninen, my friend, just finished his dissertation on, on Augustine or just submitted it. So there's a couple Augustine scholars as well. Then there's analytic theology or philosophy of religion, science and religion issues. Uh, very active two guys, Oli Pekka Vainio and Aku Visal, and also third one, Roke Koyonen, and they organize an annual heat conference, which is a bit ironic because it's usually organized in the winter, but it's called Helsinki Analytic Theology, so that's why that's where heat comes from. Uh, and um, and they are like crazily effective and they, they publish like trillions of articles and books, these guys. So yeah, but they, they, it's uh, more on the sort of philosophical side and from the analytic uh, tradition. Well then church history is big in, in Finland, especially Finnish church history and Lutheran church history and Pietist revival movement church history. So Finns know their own church history very well. It's not really known outside of Finland. So there's a lot of uh, interesting uh, possibilities or potential there to do also in English to popularize and interact with uh, Finnish. Uh, Lutheranism. That's something I hope to do in the future. Uh, I, I will give a sort of overview and explain a little bit of those movements and awakenings and such in a second, but first I need a glass of water. It's actually not a glass, it's plastic. Okay, so we don't have much time for this, but I promise to mention the four other awakenings. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of many kinds of Lutheranism in Finland. So there's not just one kind of Finnish Lutheranism, there's at least 20 kinds of Finnish Lutheranism. But the main four awakenings from the 1800s and the oldest is from the 1700s, the prayerfulness movement, these are sort of non-standardized translations, but Rukolevaisus means something like prayerfulness. Um, and, uh, and, and it is from the 1700s, and they still all use the 1700s uh, books, like liturgical books and prayer books, and they also pray on their knees, and some people have suggested that it is uh, sort of a remnant from the Catholic Middle Ages, and, and also because it is in Western Finland, people have suggested that it has a sort of Franciscan spirituality, there are some links to Franciscan spirituality. Uh, the Franciscans had a convent in Rauma, a medieval town, so there's uh, it's possible, but it's something that I'd like to study more. Uh, the prayer prayer movement, they also had these interesting sleep preachers. So especially women who, who went into a sort of a coma-like state or sleep, and then they just preached. And then when they woke up, they didn't really remember anything. But a lot of people sort of converted through these through this, uh, uh, sleep preachers. And... Um, yeah, Anna Rogel is, is a famous one, and there is a friend of mine who's called Aki Rogel, who's from the same family. He's a Catholic convert, and he's uh, from the same family as this famous sleep preacher. So just to make some Catholic connections. Okay, then there's a Heranesis, so it can be translated the Awakening or something like that. And uh, the, the famous, fa well, it's not the founder, but the, so the father figure in this movement is Papa Rotsalainen. He was a peasant, and uh, from Savo, like Eastern Finland, deep Finland over there, a poor area in that time. And they have these uh, songs of Zion, there's a very strong tradition of hymns, songs uh, in, in Finnish Lutheranism, a strong musical tradition. And uh, then they meet in conventicles, they are these sort of pietist meetings where they sing and then they preach, like people speak freely or, or then it could be organized beforehand, who speaks, depends. And their spirituality is that they are sort of beggars of mercy. They don't know too much for sure if they are saved or if they even believe, but they sort of beg for mercy and they wait until, this is a famous quotation, they have the, the sort of awaiting faith and the longing faith 
until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. So that's their spirituality in a nutshell. And then there's evangelicalism, but this is very misleading because it's very different from American evangelicalism. So in Finland, ev evangelisus means uh, a Lutheran confessional movement uh, studied by this, uh, this guy called Hedberg. Uh, and so we can call it Hedbergenism. And their view of faith is very joyful, quite certain, uh, strong emphasis on the sacraments, on, on the biblical revelation, and on justification of the ungodly. And um, these two movements split in the 1800s and they all condemned each other that time, but nowadays it's more like friendly, but yeah, they still exist separately. And then there's Lestadianism, which is uh, our special uh, um, northern religion, uh, the biggest movement founded in the, in, or uh, that has arisen in the Nordic countries, Christianity of the North. Uh, known for its sort of <coughs> ascetical or uh, very strict pietist manners such as zero alcohol and no TV and no birth control, so big families. Often it is said that only the Catholics, you know, are faithful to the tradition of, of you know, uh, no birth control, but the Lestadians are as well, and actually they don't even use the natural family planning, so they have about 10 kids per family on average. And so they're the biggest revival movement in Finland, started in the north in Lapland, but it's in the big cities, so it's everywhere. And the other interesting thing is they use confession and absolution a lot uh, uh, in Jesus' name and blood, but they also use it uh, not only in church, in the confessional, which they don't really have, but but uh, but but anyone with the Holy Spirit, any believer can, can give it, so they use it in the families, uh, throughout the day, in the evening, and uh, since every believer is a can, can do it, that means that also children can do it. So there is a very interesting phenomenon of child confessors in, in Lestadianism that I think should be studied theologically <laughs> sometime. Um, and then they're also very famous for exclusivist ecclesiology, so, so technically, officially, they believe that they are the only true believers going to heaven and the others bye-bye, but, but of course there are some people who are more open, uh, and, and then later we'll come to the interesting phenomenon that some of them are Catholic as well. Okay, and then in the 19th century, so all of these movements basically condemned each other, and they all accused each other of crypto-Catholicism, so all of them have some Catholic elements, and that's interesting from a Catholic perspective to sort of try to make a synthesis of one of my projects for the future. And then a couple of words from, for, yeah, like, or images from each movement. So this is Pavarotso and the peasant, he started over there in Savo, and then that time there were no buses or anything, but he, he was like a Paul, like a Finnish Paul, Apostle Paul. He traveled to all those places, you know, doing these conventicles. And uh, that's why it became a huge movement. And nowadays they have an annual feast called Herate Juhlat, like, uh, well, Awakener Party. Sunday, <laughs> 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 uh, no. Awakener festivities or something uh, and, uh, and 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 it, it gathers about maybe 20,000 people every summer and uh, last year in this this, uh, this 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 religious event they quoted the Pope twice so that was something I noticed because I could follow all this uh, online because of COVID so that was nice so that nowadays they're quite open and ecumenical and their current executive director is a young man uh, Carla Hiltonen, who has studied uh, St. John of the Cross on an academic level, so there is again a Catholic mystical connection, and he has sort of tried to compare Pavel Rotsalainen's view of the mystical mysticism with uh, John of the Cross. And there you see the house where uh, Pavel Rotsalainen used to live. It's like a small old peasant's house from the 19th century, and it's on an island, and uh, it's sort of like a pilgrimage place in Finland for this movement. Well, then the other movement, the so-called evangelicals, the, the joyful Hedbergians, they also have a, a meeting every every year called the Gospel Party. <laughs> so uh, uh, they, they also gather about maybe 20,000 people and, and they're more, let's say, youthful and uh, they have a band and things like that. And they're joyful and, 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 and uh, as I said before, it's heavy emphasis on the sacraments, so they are also quite sort of high church or close to Catholicism in many ways, although because they are confessional Lutherans, they might also be very polemical against Catholicism in some other respects. Nowadays they have a problem because they are conservative Lutherans, they don't accept 
women priests and uh, not to mention the new thing about the marriage so they are in a difficult position in the Lutheran Church in Finland because their people are not ordained pastors so then they might get their ordinations from somewhere else uh, and there is this constant sort of polemics on discrimination on both sides like they think they are discriminated in the Lutheran Church and then the others say that they discriminate against women and uh, LGBT and so on. In recent years there have been some prominent evangelicals or Hedbergians that have also joined the Catholic Church, uh, an interesting thing. And uh, last year I organized as a guide or tour leader an ecumenical pilgrimage to the founders too, and it turned out that many of the leaders of this movement hadn't been there, but I was the first one to take them there. Then there's the Lestadians, they have the biggest uh, gathering and they call it the summer services. It gathers about 80,000 people every summer, it's the biggest religious event in the Nordic countries every summer. It's international as well. And here's Lestadius, the, the, the founder, he was preaching in Lapland and a lot of people stopped drinking. And then uh, he was also a botanist and um, scholar and guide to the last king of France who came to explore the north when he was not yet king in, in his youth. Um, in the US it is known as uh, Apostolic Lutheranism or Old Apostolic Lutheranism or Lestadianism. There are about 20 branches of it, so it, it also splits quite a lot. Um, and they also have, why am I talking about this in the Ratzinger conference? Because they have uh, a Bavarian greeting, Grüß Gott. Uh, they have in Finnish, Jumalan Terve, which literally means God, hello. <laughs> but it, it's more something like, more like, you know, uh, Terve is, means healthy or it's like salute. So, uh, salut de Dieu, yes, so uh, they say this to each other, but there's a theological uh, underpinning to this greeting, so unlike Bavaria, where you say it to everyone, the Lestadians, at least the conservative Lestadians, the biggest movement, they say it to the ones that they think are, that are believers. So this also becomes a social sort of weapon, we can say, and a uh, sort of psychological uh, drama, you know, like, did he say it to me, should I say it to him, and so on, you know, so... That's one interesting thing. And then, yeah, in the last years, and two of them are here, I'm honored to have them as my friends, uh, have become Catholic, and, and we have been thinking about if there is such a thing as Lestadian Catholicism, and it's, uh, it's very interesting. We can talk about it more later. <laughs> then there is <laughs> another famous, famous phrase. <laughs> <coughs> is, is the head of the Finnish Theological Institute that gathered together all these conservative movements. There's a lot of these revival movements and organizations that in the 80s sort of uh, criticized the liberal teaching of the uh, theological faculty in Helsinki and they started their own theological instruction. Uh, first it was sort of profiled on the women priesthood issue and, and so on. Uh, but uh, nowadays there it's, it's uh, well, Let's say that's not the central thing anymore. Um, and then there was this uh, well, scholar, Timo Eskola, who so was a researcher there, I must mention, because he also commented on Ratzinger's book on Jesus. Um, it was a critical book, as I said, the old generation of these people are usually a bit anti-Catholic, so, so it was appreciative in some ways, but then his, his main argument was that Jesus of Nazareth is still a Catholic book. So, of course, what, what should you expect? The post book is Catholic, but the point was that, you know, the, the way of salvation presented there is, is very different from the Lutheran way, and we Lutherans should realize that this is a Catholic book and we, we are not supposed to agree with it. So it was a, a, a critical uh, review, you know, against those who think that we still have, we already have the same view on, on justification and salvation and so on. And it was pretty strong at the end. It was like, but it's a good book, you know, to combat this sort of liberal, historical, critical, biblical studies. Um, so it is to be hoped that some, some liberal Lutherans find it and then get interested in the Bible and in the Jesus and their own tradition and then can save them, save their souls by, by sort of, you know, embracing the, the, the Lutheran gospel. <laughs> so, anyways, <clears throat> then there's two commentators I want to mention briefly, Yuri Komolainen and Mikko Ketola, who are the most sort of uh, often seen faces on Finnish TV whenever there's anything with the Pope, they are usually the ones to, to comment. So Mikko Ketola is a church historian, he wrote a book, for example, on Opus Dei, and uh, a lot of articles on, on different Catholic issues. 
and he's more of a sort of a Heike Räisenen disciple, so more on the, on the, we can say, liberal side rather than the conservative side. And maybe also the same goes for Yuri Komalainen, although the profile is a bit different. He's a dogmatician and, and uh, an expert in Hinduism and Catholicism, and let's say favors a bit sort of the liberation theologians and, and such. Uh, likes Pope Francis quite a lot and is very active on Twitter. So uh, these are the two people who comment in the media uh, from, from the uh, academic and Lutheran side on Ratzinger. Well then finally, we are already coming closer to the, close to the end, but I wanted to give a sort of a general overview of the Finnish ecumenical context. So Catholic, Lutheran, Orthodox Finland. Finland is uh, a very ecumenical country, very Lutheran country, uh, but also we have 400 years of Catholic history from the 12th century. St. Henry came and was martyred in Kölya, and his uh, body was held in this church in Nosianen, and then there is uh, this uh, copy of the sarco sarcophagus in the National Museum in Helsinki. You can visit it and see it. And then his relics were kept in Turku, the Turku Cathedral from uh, the 1300s. And then one relic is in Helsinki, St. Henry's Cathedral, our Catholic Cathedral in Helsinki. So he's the patron saint of Finland, and the first and only saint really. Then we have Blessed Heming, also the Bishop of Turku in the 1300s. The me medieval diocese of Turku was the first Finland. It was the first uh, unit that united the so-called Finland proper, which is around Turku in the west, and then central Finland and and uh, eastern parts of Finland, like Karelia. And uh, uh, the Dominican presence was very significant, so we have to mention the Dominican influence that was there for 300 years. Dominicans came to Finland already in 1249, very early, and they stayed there until the Reformation, when their convent burned. We don't know if somebody burned it or it just uh, was an accident, but then after that the friars went to, to become uh, well, uh, pastors in the parishes, and it was the sort of transition period of the Reformation. So, so it was uh, not yet really clear what would happen with the Church of Sweden, and, and finally, it just gradually uh, consolidated the, the, the Lutheran position. But it was a sort of very gradual and, and moderate process. Uh, Mikael Agricola was the so-called Finnish reformer, but he was also very sort of conservative and moderate reformer. So he had. Confession as a Sacrament in his Catechism, which is the first Finnish language book, the ABC book. He had the Hail Mary in his Catechism, even though it was a shorter version, just the first part from the Bible. And then he wrote the biggest prayer book in the Reformation era, which contained a lot of medieval prayers um, it, from the Turku uh, Missal, uh, the Turku Missal, medieval Turku Missal, which was the first book printed for Finland in 18, uh, 1488. Uh, the Dominican influence was such that the diocesan liturgy in the Diocese of Turku, medieval Diocese of Turku, was the Dominican liturgy. So this is a very precious fact for Finnish Dominicans, that it is the only diocese in the world where the diocesan liturgy was actually the Dominican liturgy. And uh, yeah, so Agricola was a sort of a Catholic Lutheran reformer. He retained many Catholic prayers and elements. And, um, and this is sort of the fifth, uh, 16th century basis for the modern Catholic identity of, of Finnish Lutheranism. They preserved the Episcopal structure and Episcopal uh, succession, at least they claim so. It is a, a difficult topic that should be studied more and, and discussed more. There's many problems with it, but, 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 uh, but there is also a solid basis for it. And, um, and so uh, Finland has been called a model of ecumenism. There is an annual pilgrimage since the 1980s to Rome every January. Uh, the Pope gives an audience to the Finnish delegation and gives a speech to them. And Finland is the only country that has such a, a tradition with the Pope that he receives us or a Finnish delegation. I have never been there, but you know the Lutheran bishop, Catholic bishop, and often also the Orthodox bishop. They meet the Pope and they have some priests with them. And then they have a mass in Santa Maria Sopra Minerva in Rome, where every other year the Lutheran bishop celebrates the Lutheran mass in the Catholic chapel, Catholic church and the Catholic bishop preaches. And every other year, the Catholic bishop celebrates the Mass and the Lutheran bishop preaches. Or it could be the Orthodox bishop preaches. And there's ecumenical vespers with the Bridgetine sisters and uh, maybe a concert and a meal. So that's uh, every, every January, around January 19th. 
And then we have the Orthodox tradition, of course, here we are in Sofia, uh, where Metropolitan Ambrosius lives. He was very influential in reconstructing the Valam Monastery, a spiritual center of Orthodoxy in Eastern Finland. And uh, Finland was, of course, originally under the Russian Orthodox Church, the Moscow Patriarchate, but after Finnish independence, uh, it became associated with the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Finnish Orthodox Church became autonomous. They are the only Orthodox Church in the world that use the Gregorian calendar and celebrate Christmas and Easter together with the Catholics and Lutherans. Uh, and also uh, the Finnish Orthodox have been ecumenical mediators in Finnish Lutheran Russian Orthodox ecumenical dialogues, which gave rise to the Mandelma school and the Finnish interpretation of Luther. And then finally about the Catholic Diocese of Helsinki, it's only 16,000 people, half of them are foreigners, about 100 languages or so, eight parishes only, so many people have, have a great distance also to church, but the Lutherans and Orthodox often lend their churches to us, and a few other chapels we have also. Currently no bishop, he's retired, Bishop Temus Ippo, the first Finnish bishop since the Reformation, and the historic order has been the, the Dehonians or the society or the uh, Sacred Heart Priests, first Dutch then Polish, then we have the Dominicans since 49, uh, mostly from France and now also Brother Gabriel Finnish, then we have Opus Dei, also one Finnish priest, uh, Father Oscar, and uh, Neocatechumenals uh, from different countries, also they have a seminary, and then we have diocese and priests, and also some uh, nuns, we have the Bridgetines, and we have the Ursulines, and we have uh, missionaries of charity, little sisters of Jesus. So some orders we have, our congregations. And uh, also, as I mentioned, new generation of Finnish priests just in the recent years. Uh, Father Martis Saviaki will be ordained just in, in a week. And I mentioned already Gabriel and Oscar, and there are some others as well. And Finnish Catholicism is characterized by immigrants, a multitude of nationalities, as I mentioned before, and the Lutheran and ecumenical context. So that is basically the sort of substance part, substance part of the lecture. So I hope you learned something interesting. And then we just have a look at the program before we end and we have a, an opportunity for questions. So just to uh, remind you, today we have the main lecture by Professor Tracy Rowland at 6. So when we finish this session, then there will be some drinks uh, or uh, whatever they have on the uh, at the reception, you can be there and talk and so on. And, and then here we have the, uh, the lecture at six. Then uh, we have uh, a dinner for those who have pre-registered in the evening and, a, and a, a little presentation or show as well. Tomorrow we have uh, just a, a, a mass here at 8 a.m. as said before, after <coughs> uh, uh, hopefully a well-slept night, and also there is breakfast for those who sleep here. And then a private visit to the reindeer park for, for, for the international guests. Then at uh, 3 p.m., uh, Dr. Peter McGregor will talk about Joseph Ratzinger's Theological Anthropology of the Heart, uh, our other Australian guest speaker. And then 4 p.m., hopefully through Zoom, we will connect with Mexico. Alejandro Sada will talk about the meaning of life, important topic. And then uh, uh, Elia Guerriero later at five will talk about um, uh, Ratzinger and Balthasar from Balthasar, and uh, Jacques Serve about peace and justice, uh, also via Zoom. In the evening we have a short Orthodox prayer. It's not a proper vigil; it will be an evening prayer, and uh, and then a light dinner here available at the reception. Some kind of salads and pies and such. Then for Sunday we have, uh, uh, after breakfast we go to uh, the Sunday Mass at St. Henry's Cathedral, the English Mass, 9.30. We visit some Helsinki sites, we visit the Studium Catholicum uh, with the guests, and uh, then we continue the academic program at 5. There is again via Zoom Pablo Blanco from Spain about the uh, world ethos and the logos, creation and, and uh, ethics and such, and then Oscar Jurekka, our Opus Dei priest and scholar, he will talk about the book of nature according to Benedict XVI. Then we have a final discussion and a concluding uh, dinner out somewhere else. So that's the program 
if you have any questions, you are free to raise them. <laughs> this is a picture from yesterday when we were in, in uh, Tallinn with Peter, Dr. Peter McGregor and uh, Dr. Right. Seagull. And I hope if the questions are too difficult, I will direct them to the Seagull. <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention. That's it for my part. Thank you.